Welcome to another edition of 42 Straight Years In. On my crackhead update, uh, car date lady, she came down this morning. Hell, I didn't cook no damn breakfast, so all she got was uh, cereal and milk and a damn cinnamon roll. That's what me and my old lady ate, so she ate the same thing we ate. And she sit and kick it with us. Uh, car date lady said, uh, she almost a virgin. She said, all I do is give these guys head. She said, I'm almost a virgin. And I need something bad. My old lady really don't like this lady. She's just being social with it. That's the way women are. She really don't be wanting her around. But, uh, you know, she leave her keys with me because I take her car and get it detailed. So, my old lady told me, said, that's her defense. When she need to get in this house, She'll come ask for her keys. But it's rare she drive her car. Uh, she sit around and ate and uh, sipped on a little Hennessy. And she got up and I asked her, I said, you want your keys? She said, no, I'm just going for a walk. And she walked on off hill. I don't know where the hell she be going. Just be walking around here in East Dallas. Uh, that's my crackhead update. Y'all know what it is. Get your shanks out. Let's get ready to ride. Yeah, I went to Dollar General yesterday. I could not find True Blue cookies. I went to Family Dollar. I couldn't find them. And uh, one of the subscribers had told me they sell them on Amazon. So I went on Amazon, and lo and behold, their True Blues are. And I tracked, I did a little research for them. Walmart sells them. It depends on which Walmart you go to. He cook as a son of a gun. I got to give to them. They were good as hell. And they caused a lot of people to get their ass in a wreck behind them damn True Blue cookies. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk on a guy who I was at, uh, at the East Ham unit with. I met him when he came off of death row. I used to talk to him all the time. Me and him was in the crowd shop uh, together, so he always talked. Uh, said, former death row inmate Randall Dale Adams is sitting in an empty Houston sports bar looking very much alive and well and dragging on a Winston cigarette. His face has filled out since his prison days, though his stoic expression remains unchanged. He managed to survive the last 25 years by stealing, not steal, stealing himself for the worse. Adam had committed no crime when he was sentenced to die for the 1976 slaying of a Dallas police officer. But it wasn't until the 1988 documentary, The Thin Blue Line, made Adam Case a call celebrity that his conviction was overturned. Having once come within three days of being executed, the 52-year-old is still trying to make sense of it all. My mother always said that the man upstairs was testing me, he says, pointing his beer bottle heavenward. I hope he's done now. The last time most people caught a glimpse of Randall Dale Adams was in 1989 when he walked out of Dallas County Jail a free man wearing borrowed clothes and a wary smile for the news cameras. What happened next was not initially the stuff of happy endings. First, there was his quarrel with Errol Morris, the maker of the Thin Blue Line, over the rights to his life story a matter that was settled out of court in 1991 but left the two estranged. Then in 1994, Adam's brother, Run, died while in the Dallas County Jail where he had been detained for driving under the influence. The official cause of death was a heart attack. And then there was Adam's own struggle to resume a normal life at the prison. I was 40 years old. I had no clothes, no money, no car, and I was living in my mother's spare bedroom, he says. 
I wanted to pick up where I left off, but I realized pretty quick that I was kidding myself. Adams' ordeal began on November 27, 1976, when he ran out of gas and hitched a ride with 16-year-old David Harris. Harris dropped Adam off around 10 o'clock that night, and Adams figured he had seen the last of the strange kid who lacked showing off his 22 caliber pistol. Less than three hours later, Dallas Police Officer Robert Wood was dead. When later questioned by the police, Harris claimed that Adams was still in the Mercury Comet when Officer Wood pulled it over after midnight and that Adams had fired the gun. Adams was charged with killing Officer Wood and Harris was a key witness against him. Harris had an extensive criminal record and a motive for shooting a police officer. He had been driving a stolen car while on probation. He had even bragged to friends in his hometown of, hometown of Vida that he had blown away a pig in Dallas. Since the Dallas police chose to believe the story, his story over Adams' alibi, which was apparently too simple, Adams said he had gone home and gone to bed. Years later, in the thin blue line, Harris would recant the story he had told detectives and concede that Adams was home at the time of the shooting. But back in 1976, the Dallas police were under pressure to solve the high-profile killing and intent on making the charges against Adams stick. Adam alleges that the lead detective in the case, Gus Rose, pointed a gun at his head during one interrogation, and when an eyewitness to the shooting could not pick Adams out of a lineup, a police officer helpfully pointed out him to her. This enlightened, she later fingered Adams at his trial. The case was tried in 1977 by Assistant District Attorney Doug Mulder who had never lost a capital case. Mulder wanted to win at any cost and was later reprimanded by the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals for prosecutorial misconduct during Adam's trial that included suppressing evidence favorable to the accused, deceiving the trial court, and knowingly using perjured testimony. Adam was sentenced to death. If not for my mother and my family, I probably would have committed suicide, Adam says, but I knew that killing myself would kill my mother. I had to make peace with my situation and believe that someday I will be proven innocent. After the Court of Criminal Appeals initially upheld his verdict 9-0 to in 1979, he was given a short time calendar with pages he could tear out for each of the last 30 days of his life. Adams would have been executed had the U.S. Supreme Court not stayed his execution three days before he was scheduled to die. The next year, the court overturned his sentence on a technicality relating to how Texas juries were selected in capital cases. Although the decision entitled Adams to a new trial, the Dallas District Attorney's Office persuaded Governor Bill Clements to commute Adams' sentence to life in prison instead, with the death Sentence removed, the Supreme Court ob objection was rendered moot. The DA avoided trial and no doubt would have exposed the weakness of the state's case, and Adam prepared to live out his days in a six by nine concrete prison cell. Adams was released in 1989 based on new evidence presented by Peter lawyer Randy Schaefer. I hired Randy Schaefer to represent me also, who had worked on Adams' behalf pro bono for years. A state district judge had ruled that Adams was indeed entitled to a new trial. The DA's office, however, declined to try him again and then dismissed all charges against him. If not for Randy, that's the lawyer, Randy Schaefer, I'd be dead right now, said Adams. Having last seen the outside world in 1976, he remembers being startled by the changed landscape when Schaefer took him to a dinner his first night as a free man. Everything was different, he says. I'm still catching up. 
Adams returned home to Ohio where he found uh, immediate fascination with his case strongly therapeutic. Now he uh he died of a of a brain aneurysm. Uh, he died of a brain tumor. He was 61 years old. But uh, I used to talk to this guy all the time, man. Anybody who would listen at this guy, man, he would tell you, man, I ain't killed that cop, man. Just like it came out in the wash, that's what he would say, the exact same thing. I remember the morning Dallas County came, picked him up, to release him, to take him back to Dallas County. Had a sergeant named Sergeant Reese. He always gave Randall Dale Adams a hard time. He on his way to the crab shop. Uh, I didn't call a crab shop yet. You got to go back to your living quarters till I call. He always give this guy trouble. The morning he got ready to leave, he tried to attack that sergeant. The warden had to restrain him. Boy, he called him all type of sorry son of a bitch. He just sit down in the middle of the hallway at, at East Ham and cried. He just sit there and cried. He's giving his freedom. Even the warden put his arm around him. It's rare you see a warden do that with an inmate. Even the warden put his arm around him, shook hands with him. Said, man, everything going to be all right, man. You finna be free, man. They need to try and attack this sergeant. That's going to be more charges, and that's going to get you locked back up again. But uh, this guy will talk to anybody. That show you how hard it is, man. Can you imagine what this man went through three days from being executed? Then he, after he released some death row, he assigned to the East Ham unit is, was billed by Newsweek magazine in 1986 as the toughest prison in America. Violence is the order of the day there. They had the worstest inmate guards. I mean, it is fucked up at that prison. And that's where he's assigned to. So quite a few guys at East Ham that came off of death row. They wasn't going to send no guys to no little unit like the walls of the wind unit or Darrington. No, they was going to a unit where they can control them if they got out of line. And this guy is a first of them. Man, that's... Anytime you talk to him, he want to talk about his case. He didn't want to talk about no prison bullshit. Cause he know he ain't committed no damn crime. I'd be in the crab shop. I always was a sympathetic ear. I, I would listen to guys. It was therapeutic to me listening to those guys. i say, well, if I can run to any type of uh, advice, uh, especially if I know anything, I done, I done research in the law library that can help one of these guys, I didn't mind conveying that information on to them. It didn't cost me shit. Helping them, it helped me. And, uh, and I always was sympathetic, man. I'd sit in the craft shop. Really, I got shit to do, man, but I was sitting and listening at this guy. And, man, and, and, and he, he, man, he'd go in a zone. He said, man, I didn't kill nobody. Now, it turns out that young guy, 16 years old, his ass is on death row. But well, he didn't been executed. They got him for a capital murder in Bowmount. Even though he set Randall Dale Adams up, he came back and tried to help him out and say, hey, man, this guy did not shoot that cop. He was nowhere around. You know, how do you make up time spent on death row, 72 hours from being executed, you get released, you got no money back then, they didn't give you no compensation. They hadn't started the compensation package. Now, he would have had close to a million dollars in compensation from the state of Texas. Because they give $80,000 so every year you was incarcerated. Then they give you a, a, a monthly stipend for the rest of your life. But it, it be hard on guys, man. They poor, ain't got no fucking help. And I got a friend now, he's at the Styles Unit. He's been there 25 years. And I be trying to do all I can for him out here. He's the same way, 25 years. He ain't killed nobody. Nobody.